some of you <clears throat> realized the context. When you look at chapter 1, remember what he was saying in chapter 1? how that there was different groups and divisions and this sort of thing, and some follow Paul and some follow uh, Cephas and some follow P, you know, uh, Apollos, and some follow Jesus Christ. I think it was really a carryover, if you kind of look at the whole context. I, I really, I was intrigued how some of you all really caught that. Um, anyhow, this is what I wrote. Uh, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you like Christians devoted to the Lord, but rather more like non-Christians, living only for your own interests. I had to talk to you like little babies, and you're still like little babies. <clears throat> when are you going to grow up? You have jealousy and envy, just like non-Christians. You argue and debate, just like non-Christians. This shows you are just like immature little children. Verse 4, when you say, I follow my senior pastor, did you not know that you were just like a non-Christian? That's the context for today. Well, I follow John MacArthur, or I follow Rick Warren, or I follow Jim McCotter. Well, you're just like non-Christians. What do you think a senior pastor is? He is not to be considered a senior pastor, but only one servant of God through whom you heard a message. They are not to be heads of parties. This is the idea of the Greek here, too. Dividing Christians up in cities. You see, when you look at chapter 1, that's, that, that was the context, wasn't it? Chapter 1 was there was churches in cities. And Paul addressed them as one church in the city. You're not to be heads of parties dividing Christians up in cities, but only doing the work God gave them. One of God's servants may see someone saved and another help them grow, but really it was God who saved them and God who had them grow. I really like Gaius's translation there. Mm -hmm. So none of God's servants are anything special, but only God who makes it all happen. Those who lead people to Christ are those who build them up. In fact, no pastor is above the other. If you look at the, the, the literal reading, this is, I, I wrote exactly what it says. They are all to be considered the same as one. And the Lord is going to reward each one depending on how hard he works. All pastors are to work together as one under God. All Christians are to be together as one, like one garden or like one building, and all directed and under God. Think of the power of that, the implication of that. that, that, that I'm not... I'm not writing a commentary. That's the, the text, if you look at it. All pastors are to work together as one under God. In a, I could have added in the city. What, what verse? Verse 9. It's right there on the screen. All Christians are to be together as one. Like one garden or like one building. And all directed under God. Verse 10. Through the grace and power of God, I, Paul, skillfully laid this perfect church model foundation. And I see the foundation with everything he was just describing. With no one special senior pastors or denominational divisions and others built on it. Or no one church model foundation and others built on it. So now for you, be very careful how you build on it. Make very sure you don't build any different. For no other foundation can ever be laid than this one, which is upon Jesus Christ, verse 11. I think verse 10 is showing. Remember, it says in Ephesians, the, the foundation was, was upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So the foundation relates to 
not Jesus Christ, but including the apostles and the prophets. All of this body of truth, Paul was condemning the division in the city, in the, in the city church. He is the chief cornerstone. But the foundation was laid by the apostles and the prophets, Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So it also relates to the pastors having one pastor that you say, I follow him, or I follow Rick Warren, or I follow Bill Heibel, or I follow John MacArthur, or I follow Chuck, uh, Chuck Missler, Chuck whoever Mistler. it is. <laughs> Put names in there. The foundation was no special senior pastor and no denominational divisions, no divisions. And then the next verse says, for no other foundation can ever be laid than this one which is upon Jesus Christ. If you work at building Christ's church, your work will be tested and revealed in the future. Wow. On the day of Christ. If it's for yourself or according to your traditions and not according to Christ's church model foundation. It will all burn up on that day. But only you personally will be saved in escaping the fire. Only work that remains for eternity will be rewarded. Do you still not realize that you all, that all you Christians in the city, this is verse 16, do you still not realize that all you Christians in the city are but one building, one church? And do you not realize that the Spirit of God no longer dwells in a physical building, but only in you as individuals and as a group? Now, if any non-Christian or Christian destroys, hurts, divides, breaks up God's holy building. In other words, the church in that city. I didn't put that in. What all you Christians are, his church, God himself will destroy that person. Princes. That makes them, that means they'll be weak, sick, or die. 1 Corinthians 11.30. That's exactly the sin of 1 Corinthians 11.30. Division. Dividing the people in the church in Corinth. Don't deceive yourselves. Do you think you're pretty smart? You better consider all you have thought about your great smarts as being pretty stupid. So you really can be smart with the infinite and eternal wisdom of the God of gods. For the wisdom of this world is laughable to God, as the Bible says, God uses man's own stupid wisdom and logic to have him trap himself. And as the Bible says again, God knows what the pseudo-intellectual is thinking and how stupidly futile all their thoughts are. So don't be proud or glory in any one human, whether a non-Christian or even any Christian leader, for they all belong to you. All the greatest Christian leaders in the world belong to you. In fact, everything in the world God has given to you for your use and purpose. That should be not live, it should be life. Life and even death. Everything that's here today and whatever is in the future, it is all, it all belongs to you. And you belong to Christ. Christ belongs to God. When you think of this in the context, uh, God has mercy and grace and all, but we, as I more and more meditated on 1 Corinthians, I, I, I'm, I'm really stunned at how powerful Paul was in chapter 1 with the church being divided by pastors, by their leaders. I follow Cephas, I follow Peter, I follow Paul. Oh, well, I, we follow Jesus Christ. And they were dividing, too, by saying, you're, we're right and you're all, you're all wrong. And 
uh, and here Paul again took, he didn't refer to Cephas or, or, or Jesus Christ to condense it, he just referred to Apollos and himself. But uh, so basically the two thoughts, <clears throat> the, the, the foundation that was laid by the apostles and prophets, as Ephesians says, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, the two teachings, one is Christ is the cornerstone, but the two teachings that relate to the foundation, do you know what the foundation for the church was? That he was condemning? It was that it would be united as one church in a city, not divided, not denominations. That's number one. And what is in concert with that, that divides it, that causes that to happen, is the, the spiritual leaders. I follow this spiritual leader, I follow this senior pastor, or I follow this man. And, and, and Paul said, we're, we're just servants. It's Christ who we really need to be following. The, and, and, and furthermore, all these men belong to you. You're not, this one just, uh, you know, Sean doesn't belong to Cherry Hills community, that he belongs to us. You know another pastor? John MacArthur belongs to you. All the good men belong to you. In fact, everything in the world belongs to you, he says. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So it's interesting, he hits, Christ is the, is the, corners, the, the chief cornerstone, which is a part of the foundation. But in that foundation, he wants the, all the believers in the city to be one, and he wants to have the right understanding on the leaders. The wrong understanding with leaders will cause division. And, and, and he says, and he's very, par I mean, I'm not saying this, so don't say Jim says this, so McCotter. And God may have mercy and grace because of people being blinded by their tradition after generations, but I think it's amazing where he says in verse 16, uh, or excuse me, verse 17, now if any non-Christian or Christian, he says any human, destroys God's holy building, his church, and the destruction there relates, the context is, if you divide it. If a pastor gives the mentality of we're separate from those other Christians, why is this important? Because this goes against Jesus' one prayer. John 17, it's the only prayer he prayed. Now, my dear fellow pastors really are not seeing this in the scripture. Someday... Maybe when we have live TV networks, some will see it. And maybe some will fear it. Maybe we'll see some unite. And I show historically in the book I wrote, Christian Nation Now, that in every country, every city, where Christians were united, historically, they turned those cities upside down. And that's why this is so, that's why Paul talked about it in chapter one. He laid the foundation of this truth in chapter one. And then he gets back into it here and again, chapter two. And 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 Moose, you and you, Gaius, you hit you hit it on that. You used the word denomination. Denomination. In a city. That's deplorable. And he and he, and in chapter one, he says, he warns again it in the authority and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want our attitudes to see, hey, everybody that's a believer in our city, all the, all the leaders that some are following individually and others are following, they all belong to us. We don't need to have this. And if you think that way, what is it? Remember in the first part of the chapter? You're like non-Christians. You're like babies. Why? Because you're envious. You're jealous. You're, you're <coughs> proud of your leader who you're following. Well, it doesn't matter. It's my leader too then. <laughs> so we need to have this attitude. We need to humbly model this, humbly, and when God gives us opportunity with ones that want to know, we need to humbly share it. And uh, but really, this is this has been great, and what what all y'all wrote, I just uh, I think the 
that was really great. Does anybody else have any other thoughts? Commission, doesn't it? Because uh, because it relates to really getting the gospel out. It relates to having Christ reign in cities. He wants to. Jesus will obviously reign in the city if the Great Commission is fulfilled because they'll not only know all his commandments, they will be taught to do all his commandments. He wants in our generation to be reigning and leading in the city, not the heathen. God has not ordained any heathen to reign in any state. God has allowed it. God will allow it. He'll allow it. The Israelites, they prayed for meat and they wanted, you know, meat and God finally granted their request but sent leanness to their souls. So God allows a lot of things because God hasn't made you a puppet. He hasn't made the church a puppet. He allows all sorts of things. But it doesn't mean that that is what he, he desires. He's made it real clear what he desires. God is not willing that any should perish but some perish. So, so God is not willing, God doesn't want any unrighteousness. He doesn't want, but he has allowed sometimes the wicked, he allowed pharaohs to come in to, to discipline when Israel didn't honor the Sabbath. He had a wicked king come in and take him over and basically spank him big time. So God will allow the wicked to come in. But don't be naive as so many Christians are in confusing the sovereignty of God, thinking, oh, that's what God wants. <clears throat> Any more than, does God want anybody to be not saved? Of course not. He's not willing. He doesn't desire anybody to be lost. But he will not force his will. On the church, he will not force his will. Remember the last verse in the Bible on the church? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door. I'll come in. God, it is not God's desire that any heathen man be a civil leader. Any more than it's not God's desire that any heathen man be a pastor in any church. But there's many heathen that are pastors in churches. Any more than it's his desire for any father, the head of any family, to be a heathen. But there are many heathen fathers, aren't there? You understand that theological distinction? That's really pretty important. Heathen Faith. Well, unsaved. Oh. A father that's not saved, that doesn't know the Lord. That's, that's fatalistic thinking, and that's blaming God. No, God, God blames us. But he wants every father to be a believing, a Christian father, and to lead his household in the ways of God. He wants each church to have leaders that are born again and are godly men. Many are, some are not born again and many are not godly. But he wants them all to be born again and godly that are leading his church. He wants every man to be born again and godly that is leading his state. No family belongs to Satan. They belong to God. No church belongs to Satan. It belongs to God. No state belongs to Satan. And so we need to see this. Boy, I, I'm praying and I'm believing that someday we're going to see, especially when we get the word out, you know, there, there was a famine in the land in, in the Old Testament in times when the word wasn't out. But then Joab, a young kid in his teens, he found the word and he ripped his clothes and he told all the people to go out, we're going to follow the law of God. I'm believing is this word, this truth, what you've heard me share today, it's shocking that it's not out in the Christian world. It, I mean, it, but it's so clear. It's like, how can, how can one monk be right and all Christianity be wrong? But I don't know how to read it any different than you, John. So let's pray. God would like to use our little seed and our little voice. And I think he's going to. He's preparing us. There's a lot... You know, before you go up against an army of 20,000 with an army of 10,000, you better count the cost. 
and I've counted the cost, and the reason I'm not blowing the trumpet except in my little, our little private groups is because we don't quite, we're not quite ready <laughs> for the invasion. Because I want to tell you, when we stick our head above the foxhole, it's going to be all out war. And you better be sure you've got enough to go up against 20,000. And so God is building. He's building it in writing. He's building it in character. He's building understanding. He's building some of you. you, be, you you're, some of you don't realize God's going to use you in these truths that are in the Word of God. God's going to use you. And it's more important than aviation school. <laughs> It's more important than whatever you're interested in. Whatever you're interested in. It's more important than your job. It's more important than anything in the world. Seek first. It's more important than what you're interested in. It's more important than what John's interested in. Seek first. The kingdom of God. So, this is great. 1 Corinthians 4 is your assignment next week, okay? And don't let the dog eat your assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is good. Did you like this? You want to do it again?